In this second part of our study of ionisation enthalpy, we're going to look at trends in the size of the ionisation enthalpy uh, for various situations. By the end of the presentation, you ought to be able to describe and explain the trend in the size of the first ionisation enthalpy for elements going down a group, also for elements going across a period, and you ought to be able to describe how successive ionisation enthalpies compare with each other for a given element. So, for instance, first compared to second compared to third ionisation enthalpy, and so on. We need to use some of these trends also to be able to explain properties that we see varying within a group, such as reactivity. We'll look first at how first ionisation enthalpy varies if you look down a group in the periodic table. In terms of describing the trend, we can look at the group two elements as an example. And if you look at the graph here, we're going from beryllium on the x-axis at the left down the group through magnesium, calcium, strontium and barium. And in each case, the y-axis shows the size of the first ionisation enthalpy for the element. So hopefully it's very clear, uh, looking at group two there, that first ionisation enthalpy decreases in size for elements as you go down a group. And this isn't specific to group two. Uh, we'll see the same pattern uh, for any group in the periodic table. As well as describing the trend in first ionization enthalpy going down a group, we need to be able to explain it. And the explanation involves several features. So listen carefully and make sure that you understand this step-by-step -step explanation. The first thing we need to say <coughs> is that going down the group you're going to see more occupied shells of electrons. Hopefully this makes sense to you. Each new period going down the group introduces one more occupied shell of electrons in the atom. Well, so what, we ask? So two things. Firstly, if we have more occupied shells of electrons, the outer shell will be further away from the nucleus. And secondly, we'll also see increased shielding of the outer shell from the nucleus because of the occupied shells in between. Well, again, so what? Both of those factors add together to mean that as you go down the group, there'll be less attraction between the positive nucleus and the negative outer shell electron that you're trying to remove. And so the final step in the explanation is the consequence of that, that therefore as you go down the group, less energy is needed to remove an outer shell electron. We could very nice and tidily leave our explanation at that point, but to do so wouldn't be entirely honest. We need to face up to the fact that there's a conflicting thing going on as we go down the group, which is that we're putting more protons into the nucleus. And this, of course, is going to increase the attraction between the negative outer shell electron that we're trying to remove and the positive nucleus. So what we can say, though, is that the decrease in attraction between the outer shell electron and the positive nucleus uh, due to the extra shells outweighs the increase in attraction caused by the additional protons in the nucleus. So overall we've got our trend that first ionization enthalpy decreases going down a group. Next we'll turn our attention to the trend in first ionization enthalpy as we move across a period in the periodic table. And once again we need to be able to describe this trend. If we take an example, period 3 here, and look at the graph, we can see as we move left to right across the graph, we're going left to right across the third period from sodium to argon. And the overall trend is that first ionization enthalpy is increasing across the period. Now yes, there's a few little blips and strange bits along the way and, and you can explain that later on in the course through detailed electronic configuration ideas. But you need to know the overall trend that first ionization enthalpy increases as you go across a period. Once again, we need to be able to explain the trend. And this time we're going to start where we finished when we were thinking of, about going down the group with the number of protons in the nucleus. Now, as you go across a period, the atomic number is counting up. So the number of protons in the nucleus is increasing. So what? So... If the number of protons is increasing, then we're going to have an increased attraction between the positive nucleus and the negative outer shell electrons. And so what? Well, that's going to mean more energy is needed to remove an outer shell electron. 
Our explanation should, however, always cover both the idea of number of protons in the nucleus and these ideas about distance of the outer shell from the nucleus and shielding. So what happens as we move across a period? Well, uh, the number of occupied electron shells is constant across a period. Hopefully that makes sense. As you move across the period, uh, you're filling the same outer shell. So we've got the same number of shells going across a period. This means that going across the period, there's little change in the distance from the nucleus to the outer shell and little change in the degree of shielding. So now we've got the increase in attraction due to the extra protons uh, without really any conflicting factors to worry about. So overall, as we said, across a period, first ionization enthalpy increases. This 3D representation of first ionization enthalpy within the periodic table neatly reinforces the two trends we've discussed. Looking down each of the groups, you can see uh, the first, ion first ionization enthalpy decreasing. And moving left to right across each of the periods, you can see this overall increase within the period in the first ionization enthalpy. The final trend that you need to be able to describe is what's called the trend in successive ionization enthalpies for an element. What we mean by that is if you take one particular element, how does its first ionization enthalpy compare to its second, to its third, and so on. To have a look at this trend, we'll pick an example, and this is the first six ionization enthalpies of carbon. Carbon's got atomic number six, and you've got six electrons. So this is literally removing all six electrons from carbon one by one. And if we look at the graph, we can see that each successive ionization enthalpy is larger than the one before. For this trend, you only really need to be able to state that. You don't need to go into any detailed explanation. But what we do need to look at is the other thing we can see in this graph, which is that we get seemingly a surprising jump at some point in the amount of energy required to remove the next electron. For carbon, it happens after the fourth ionization enthalpy, a huge jump up to the amount of energy involved in the fifth ionization enthalpy. We do need to understand the reason for this, the, the big jump, and so to do that we'll look at a range of elements. The table here shows the successive ionization enthalpies for a number of different elements. And in each case, the blue highlights the point at which we see a huge jump up. So for instance, for sodium, we can remove one electron, the first ionization enthalpy, for just 496 kilojoules per mole. But then the second ionization enthalpy needs 4,560 kilojoules per mole, nearly 10 times as much. And if we pick out other elements like aluminium, uh, we see that we see the, the jump again, but not necessarily at the same point. So for aluminium, we can do the first, the second, and the third ionization enthalpies for relatively small amounts of energy, and then a big hop up to 11,600 kilojoules per mole for the fourth ionization enthalpy. I'm pretty sure that with a little bit of thought uh, for what you know about these elements, their position in the periodic table and so on, and what we've talked about already for ionization enthalpies, that you could come up with a good explanation for this observation yourself. So when you pause the video at this point, just see if you can put into words a reason for these jumps up in successive ionization enthalpy that we see here. Well, hopefully uh, you figured out that what we're seeing is the point at which you start removing electrons from a shell closer to the nucleus, having emptied the outer shell. So for sodium, it's group one, only one electron in the outer shell. Once we've removed it, we have to start taking electrons from a shell which is closer to the nucleus. And of course, that means less distance, less shielding, so bigger attraction between the positive nucleus and the negative electrons, hence a lot more energy needed to remove electrons. Here's a chance to check how well you've got to grips with the ideas so far. Uh, in each of these three questions, you need to look at the two ionization enthalpies uh, shown and decide which of the pair is larger. So pause the video and have a go. Well, in question one, hopefully you picked the first ionization enthalpy of fluorine. It's further across the period from lithium, more protons in the nucleus for the same number of occupied shells, and so more energy required to remove that first electron. For the second one, it'll be the second ionization enthalpy of fluorine. Remember, each successive 
ionization enthalpy is larger than the one before. And for the third one, it'll be this first ionization enthalpy of fluorine. Fluorine is above bromine in group 7, and so the outer shell's closer to the nucleus. Less shielding, less distance, stronger attraction, more energy required to remove the outer shell electron. Remember, that's of greater significance than the fact that bromine has more protons in its nucleus. A further question, uh, this graph now shows the first four successive ionization enthalpies for an element. Look at the graph, look at the values uh, for the different ionization enthalpies, and you should be able to say what group in the periodic table you'll find this element. Well, the element actually is beryllium, and that's a group two element. So hopefully you, hopefully you spotted you remove the first two electrons for relatively low amounts of energy, and then a big hop up for the third ionization enthalpy as you start taking electrons from a shell closer to the nucleus. Finally, we'll spend a moment thinking about some consequences that we can uh, draw out of our understanding of trends in ionization enthalpies. And the first one we'll look at is the reactivity of metals. From your study of chemistry so far, hopefully you've got the idea that metals become increasingly reactive down the group. Now, metals react uh, when they form ions from the element by losing their outer shell electrons. And, of course, we've said that as you go down the group, the outer shell is further from the nucleus, greater distance, more shielding, uh, and so it takes less and less energy to remove those outer shell electrons. Non-metals, on the other hand, become increasingly reactive up the group, so the thing at the top of a non-metal group tends to be most reactive. And with non-metals, of course, when you form ions from the element, you're gaining electrons into the outer shell. And we can relate this again to the trends we've discussed. So at the top of the group, the outer shell is closest to the nucleus, so you've got the least distance, the least shielding, lots of attraction uh, to pull electrons into the outer shell, and so very reactive for the non-metals. Finally, uh, we can think about the charge that metals form, and they form positive ions. And, of course, what we know is that the metal will form a positive ion with a charge equal to the number of its outer shell electrons, certainly for the main group elements anyway. And so now we can relate that to what we've discussed about successive ionization enthalpies. Once you've emptied the outer shell, there'd be a hugely uh, larger amount of energy needed to take further electrons. So naturally, we don't tend to get ions with a positive charge larger than the number of electrons in the outer shell.